Uh, detecting the TB cases and the diagnostics are very, very critical part of this whole ending TB strategy. Even the government's highest commitment within the National Action Plan for accelerating uh, efforts for ending tuberculosis. And within that, one of the major areas that was identified was that what and how can we bring the diagnostics closer to the people? And that's how, you know, like this idea of one-stop uh, mobile van came, uh, particularly also looking at the geographical difficulties, the terrain. We thought it was very important that we have a, a, a solution that can be quite comprehensive and is closest to the people. So the, the idea was that it's a van which is equipped with the TB screening facility, which actually consists of a digital X-ray unit, a tool at the platform, a connectivity to cloud services for accessing the artificial intelligence algorithm, and a telehealth system along with the cloud electronic health records. This technology-driven approach and the lab of the weapons actually has been something where we could say that uh, the TB screening, particularly with the X-ray and with the uh, tool, we are kind of seen an increased number because it is something people are saying, oh, this is coming to us, this is for us. It is also addressing some way that the stigma of accessing the health facility for this purpose. And I think that's where we can say that in a short span of time, it's around 7,000 individuals who have been screened um, in, uh, you know, like in a short span of time with more than 600 people who have been identified like for, uh, you know, like in terms of the presumptive for tuberculosis, and, uh, you know, like those who uh, put on to the treatment or with the other approach that we are putting it up with other interventions. From the policy and political commitment to action on the ground is the way that lab on the wheels got actualized uh, for the people of the more less thing. So this is the reason why this one-stop uh, you know, lab on the wheel was put into place and why this was considered uh, that we are looking at it in a manner that it brings, like say, increase in the case detection, which we are seeing is only a 32% increase in the detection that has been observed. Because if you have digital X-ray with AI enabled function, if you have TrueNet and you have gene expert network, uh, it is possible for us to get towards uh, a data that needs to be utilized for decision making. And that's where we are actually transitioning towards an integrated case-based electronic surveillance system. And it's not only for TB that we are also looking into integrating with HIV and malaria as a first one, which is again a commitment that the country is making. I mean, the lab on wheels, uh, not only for the tuberculosis program, but even otherwise, it's a very important, particularly in the uh, arena when we are talking about you know high threat pathogens and our ability to detect and diagnose them at and at the earliest level. At the time when we're talking about climate resilient uh, systems, but the climate sensitive diseases and the related diagnostics that may need to be there, uh, you know, in relation to also uh, the border areas, the land border, particularly countries which share the land borders, uh, in such places and such, uh, you know, situations, the lab, the lab on wheels uh, could really play a very, very important role. Uh, the distances, particularly in the geographical terrain that we are talking about, between the municipality headquarters, the district headquarters, and a particular site could be quite challenging. Uh, it is still early days for us. We are, uh, you know, like having very seamless operations. We are documenting these lessons that we are coming together, both for uh, further scaling up of this experience, or variant of these experience. You know, for example, the reason I'm saying uh, it is also to take our learning, early learning from the lab on wheels when we club the, uh, the digital X-ray and the molecular diagnosis to say, can we just take the digital X-ray for a larger number because where is not able to go everywhere. So the variants of this model uh, need to be also adapted and scaled up and replicated. So in Timur-Leste, right now, we are doing a mix of both. Case detection seems and sounds so very simple. 
But that's where the whole planning is required. That's where the whole strategy is required. That's the first step. And if the first step is not completed and is not universal, then the next of these steps will be then, you know, proportion of that what we will do. Uh, we also learned that it is possible for us to have all the SARI, the, the severe acute respiratory illnesses, as well as the uh, influenza-like illnesses patients and the patients who have been detected or been screened for COVID-19, that we could also screen them for tuberculosis. So, you know, like from a general population with screening to a strategic screening that we can look into either through vulnerability assessment on one side, which is at a household level, but on the other side at a facility level, can we do and look into the bi-directional screening. So, my message is that there are multiple approaches, multiple techniques, multiple technologies that are available. And based on our local country context and the situation is what we may need to really uh, adopt or have a mixed approach or a singular approach. But the thrust would have to be active case finding and the thrust has to be as high as possible the case detection because the next of the steps will then follow uh, with regard to treatment, treatment adherence, concurrently of course with the prevention that we are so focused on because with the preventive therapy that is available now. Because it's important when we talk about treatment, on one side, the WHO uh, recommended regimes need to be made available. And two, they have to be really made available. The drugs, medicines have to be made available in the country. And to that extent, this collaboration and partnerships have really played instrumental role. Uh, the treatment regime that has been developed for four months for the drug sensitive and six months for the drug resistance tuberculosis. And now by all, uh, oral shorter treatment regime, which is what is being followed in the country as per the WHO recommendation. And my WHO technical team continues to work with the Ministry of Health as, you know, like uh, part of our technical assistance, as part of our agreement uh, with the government and the partners. So these are the regimes that we are, uh, are you know, kind of pursuing and following and are making, uh, you know, like making sure with the ministry and the global fund uh, that these regimes are adhered to so that, uh, you know, like one part is the adherence and on the other side, side, we are making sure that these are not stopped out and the supply chain is streamlined and managed and maintained from the center to the municipality, to the center level and to the individual level in a way. So Timur Lester also has a huge challenge and a problem of undernutrition. Uh, we are a country which has a severe challenge with 37% of under five children who have been stunted. So malnutrition, undernutrition for us is a, a major risk factor over here. If this was not enough, because we know malnutrition could be linked with the, um, with, you know, poverty, it could also be, but to know let's say it's not alone the challenge of malnutrition, tobacco consumption in Timor Leste is relatively very high. And that puts another risk factor, you know, like for us to be tackling in. In fact, it is both um, in terms of the, uh, the adult tobacco smoking uh, is something which uh, I could say is so high uh, that we say that in every eight individual out of 10 may be even exposed to a second end smoking year. So given that kind of an exposure, you can look at the risk factor that we need to deal and how multi-sectorality of the response for TB is important. And not only this, uh, because the way that we are a young country, uh, it's just 20 years old young country, there are challenges. We do have risk factor, which is relating to the indoor air pollution as well, because still the fossil fuel is burned for cooking uh, in the houses. In the, particularly in the remote areas. And to super adding on to this, we do also have uh, the problem of, uh, uh, you know, like uh, large numbers in terms of the alcohol consumption as well. Uh, the country which has uh, the, you know, like alcohol easily available, easily initiated. And that is where the status comes in that when we are talking about uh, prevention, when we're talking about actions that need to be taken, it's not only for TB, and you're right, that the, we can bring the TB preventive therapy, but these are the factors, these are the risk factors which are beyond uh, the health sector. 
And these are some of them that needs to be taken in addition to the actions that need to be taken by the health sector. There are other ministries and all. And to that extent, I would say why I started off earlier with the highest level of commitment, be it from the regional level, when the regional flagship, but also importantly at the country level. We have a task force at the prime ministerial level. That is multi-sectoral. And we have now the, the task forces being announced in different municipalities with the intent of addressing the whole issue of undernutrition, with the intent of looking into addressing the tobacco control and the effort that WHO is putting on the tobacco control and the ministry the government has put in. We hope that, you know, like identifying population with these risk factors, because as I mentioned in the vulnerability assessment, we look into these risk factors along with the elderly population as well, but not only found people with the TB and their close contacts whom we could put on the preventive therapy, because these risk factors, we could bring them to uh, in contact with the health system. If there was a diabetic case, for example, who was detected, or if there was a tobacco consumer, tobacco smoker, uh, they were brought to the in relate in contact with the tobacco cessation centers that WHO is supporting ministry with. So these risk factors compound the whole effort of TB and TB and. This is where, you know, like I always say the, the criticality of uh, multi-sectoral response, the, you know, like again, health in all policies approach that we have been talking about becomes so very important because on one side we feel that, well, fine till we, that the vaccine comes in, but these social vaccines can work wonders if we are able to really look into tobacco control on one side, indoor air pollution on the other side, look into the malnutrition issues, the challenges that the, the, that the people have with regard to the nutritional status, and, you know, like, plug it, merge it, and integrate it uh, with the approach of technology, technological adaptations and innovation, that this risk factors can actually be then addressed in a more comprehensive manner. In relation to the tuberculosis, I do hope that the political declaration that is being considered by the member countries uh, at the, as an outcome of the UN high-level meeting not only brings together uh, the actions, the science-based practical actionable suggestions to the member countries, the member countries themselves also commit with increased domestic funding. They also should look into embracing the uh, you know, science-based solutions recommended by WHO, be it related to prevention, be it related to detection, be it related to the newer regimes, and invest in human resource development, in the capacity development, and addressing the stigma as well. And this is where I'm looking at that the political declaration would also bring uh, the, the players, the donors, the development partners together for a concerted, cohesive, uh, you know, approaches and funding mechanisms which are not overburdening to member countries. And as we go forward, I do hope that the high-level meeting uh, of, on the TB uh, also provides us opportunity for cross-learning. As you also mentioned in the early time in our discussion, that one country can learn from the other one. So whether it is South-South collaboration and South-South cooperation that we are looking into, or with the situation that the TB is still a problem in the countries of the European region, or the trends are different and they are going differently in other regions as well, probably Southeast Asia region could actually offer a lot of solutions. And such forums actually gives us an opportunity to bring that issue at the level of the head of the state or the head of the government. And some of the governments from the region have really played uh, such wonderful uh, leadership examples uh, in the tuberculosis field. I hope that in the in New York, it would be possible for the member countries to be together, the development partner, the civil society, the voices of the community, the voices of the people which have all been heard, all have been taken, and they would be there uh, engaged in this particular discussion and dialogue. And, and we look forward to that. Uh, there is a comprehensive multi-sectoral response in action 
at the uh, country level, at the sub-national level. And in fact, only thing which I would say, at the level of an individual who may have been affected with the tuberculosis, that we are, have a responsibility to bring the de detection, treatment, and all support services to that individual and look into that how soon can we bring him back to the normal health that he or she is entitled to actually. So welcome friends to another episode of NTV Dialogues, Global Voices 9490 series. This series was launched at the midpoint of uh, the commitments uh, which governments had made to NTV along with several SDGs. Over 90 months have passed by since those promises were made, uh, less than 90 months are left. And the fight against TB is not on track uh, everywhere. But there are extremely good in, uh, innovations happening. And uh, so this is why today we are very privileged, very honored to have uh, Dr. Arvind Mathur amongst us. Dr. Arvind Mathur is the WHO representative for Timur Leste. Welcome, Dr. Mathur. Real privilege to have you amongst us. Welcome. Thank you so very much, Bobby. It's just a distinct honor and pleasure to be here on to this particular forum and to be talking about something which is so very critical at the current time. So thank you for having me and uh, in a way representing the Timor-Leste and WHO Timor-Leste with my team. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mathur. Welcome again. And uh, before uh, you know we begin the conversation, uh, I like to say that TB diagnosis is a very important critical entry point to the TB care pathway. That is the only way we can move towards TB uh, elimination. And obviously, TB prevention is also an important cog in the wheel. Let's let the photos and let the documentation speak uh, louder. So this is uh, this is what we are going to hear today. It's a very innovative approach, which we which I read on the WHO website. It's a TB laboratory on wheels in Timor Leste, and uh, I'll share the link to this uh, in the description below. And we have Dr. Uh, Arun Mathur here. So, sir, please tell us more about uh, this laboratory on wheel approach. Uh, thank you so very much, Babu, and uh, it is so very nice to understand that what you said in the beginning itself that. Uh, detecting the TB cases and the diagnostics are very, very critical part of this whole ending TB strategy. Uh, and we are very, very uh, fortunate that in the regional uh, level of the Southeast Asia region, uh, ending tuberculosis or combating the fight against tuberculosis has been one of the regional flagships for, for us in the Southeast Asia region. That gives that impetus, that gives that hope, the push to look into that what can be done in the member countries. And that's where I, the reason I wanted to start because it's a part of this whole commitment of ending TB and as a regional flagship that in Timor Leste, we were actually looking into uh, the scenario, that the situation and the challenges. So on one side, we actually worked on a higher level policy advocacy where we could say that, can we accelerate our efforts for ending TB? And in that context, we got the, of course, uh, you know, the government's highest commitment within the National Action Plan for accelerating uh, efforts for ending tuberculosis. And within that, one of the major areas that was identified was that what and how can we bring the diagnostics closer to the people? And that's how, you know, like this idea of one-stop uh, mobile van came. Uh, particularly also looking at the geographical difficulties, the terrain, we thought it was very important that we have a, a, a solution that can be quite comprehensive and is closest to the people. So the, the idea was that it's a van which is equipped with the TV screening facility, which actually consists of a digital X-ray unit, a two-lab uh, platform, a connectivity to cloud services for accessing the artificial intelligence algorithm and a telehealth system along with the cloud electronic health records. And it is something which is what that it is, uh, you know, it is uh, in relation to the sector, which is there as well. So the idea is that the, the way that it is operationalized, that when is then making and driven to different locations, and the facility where it is closer to the people, which screens the, the population in that particular locality, in that particular area. And this technology-driven approach and 
the lab in the rooms actually has been something where we could say that uh, this TV screening, particularly with the X ray and with the uh, light, we have kind of seen an increased number because it is something people are saying, oh, this is coming to us, this is for us. It is also addressing some way that the stigma of accessing the health facility for this purpose. And I think that's where we can say that in a short span of time, it's around 7,000 individuals who have been screened um, in, uh, you know, like in a short span of time, with more than 600 people who have been identified, like for, uh, you know, like in terms of the presumptive for tuberculosis, and, uh, you know, like those who have been put on the treatment or with the other approach that we are putting it up with other interventions. The, uh, you know, like it is something which is very interesting, the way that the technological adaptations of on one side the digital x-ray the artificial intelligence and the true net that this ban offers and brings it to the people and that how it has been accepted by the community and thanks to the ministry of health and the partner which is managing it because it's very important that these things also get operationalized in an effective manner and that's where i must say and must compliment uh, the partnering institution, the organization, the civil society, Havnasa, and the Ministry of Health, that while the operations are going on, there is a constant continuing backhand support that goes from WHO team as well. Uh, that's something which is very, very important. So in nutshell, this is what I would say that from the policy and political commitment to action on the ground is the way that lab on the wheels got actualized uh, for the people of the Nordeste. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mathur. Uh, really amazing to see uh, this happening on the ground. Uh, and, um, so can you please also remind us uh, uh, and underline why it is important to club X-ray with the molecular test? In no, certainly, I mean, like this was for this very, very reason that we have looked into exactly on what you have said. Uh, that on one side, we were looking into that how do we increase the case detection rate? How do we really go about uh, screening the larger populations? Uh, in a short span of time and then as we were discussing and as you rightly said that you know like these molecular diagnostics have become so much easily accessible lesser maintenance and a quicker results so on one side we have digitalized x-ray with artificial intelligence that can actually provide us with a very firmer uh, confirmation to some extent about that okay this is where the, the problem is and then we could at the same time run the molecular diagnostic within the same setting. So that is where we are also helping on to uh, the people who are coming and those who are getting suspected with the screening to be confirmatory and also look into the, uh, the, the drug resistance one in relation to the next step that needs to be taken. So our numbers from a larger comes down to a very small number that needs to be taken to the next level of testing then. For this very reason why this one-stop uh, you know, lab on the wheel was put into place and why this was considered uh, that we are looking at it in a manner that it brings like say increase in the case detection which we are seeing is already a 32 percent increase in the detection that has been observed to kind of resulting into that uh from the number of cases for which we would need to be looking at further testing for the, the drug uh, resistance and that is where the uh you know like the upward goes on with regards to the the patterns and so because then we would see how and uh, we can send these because it's not only the lab uh, in, on the wheels, but at the same time, there is a there are efforts and the support that WHO has been able to extend to the ministry, where we look into like how can we have the the universal molecular diagnosis, and um, you know in relation to uh, no drug resistance patterns, and that's what we have done. That we have provided the support. Uh, with regard to the TB light probe assay uh, for both first and second line drug susceptibility testing in the National Health Laboratory. So it's a, it's a kind of a network that we are looking at. So we have X-ray screening, which is going on, which is important, and not only in the TB mobile van, but we also got the digital X-ray, the X-ray machines, 
Because again, those are the ones which can be carried on a back kind of a thing, like a backpack, can go to the even further remote state on a back can't go. So one, but that is only for X-ray screening, and that's so very, very critical for us that we are also looking at uh, you know, uh, the X-ray screening as the first point of the screening, and then supplementing, complementing, and adding on to with the molecular diagnosis. It, it is something which I could say that all of this is helping together in our effort to one side with screening to digital X-ray, but also to the universal molecular diagnosis, but in a strategic manner. So again, it's a cost factor. It is also looking into that how do we. Uh, take into consideration the geographical terrain, where it might just be easy for us to have a digital X-ray with AI uh, enabled. And I'll, I'll share with you that uh, there are some other conditions that we have also done uh, in, in relation to the effort on uh, uh, ending TV uh, and accelerating effort by 2025. Uh, and the other one that we are moving towards to, because if you have digital X-ray with AI enabled function, if you have ProNet and you have gene expert network, uh, it is possible for us to get towards uh, a data that needs to be utilized for decision making. And that's where we are actually transitioning towards an integrated case-based electronic surveillance system. And it's not only for TB that we are also looking into integrating with HIV and malaria as a first one, which is again a commitment that the country is making. So again, the point is that why we started with the uh, with the digital X-ray screening, uh, by bringing the people the larger number together in a one setting, but also bringing the digital X-ray, which is not dependent on the uh, internet or you know taking the, the whole challenge in the country uh, where these terrains are very challenging with the internet connectivity we can have the diagnosis like the screening and the result over there we can narrow down the sample we can have a confirmatory with the molecular testing both at the WAN but also at the uh, at the municipality level where we have the gene expert available and then we can go further, you know, like with regard to the, as I said, at the national laboratory level, we're talking about TB line pro, let's say the LPA laboratory that has been set up. So it's a whole, whole continuum of things that we are looking into in terms of our uh, effort to screen, uh, detect, uh, you know, like uh, treat and prevent kind of an approach that we are taking up. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mathur, for helping us understand that. Really amazing to see. And this is what exactly what needs to happen and get scaled up everywhere in the fight against TB. So, Dr. Mathur, is this being replicated um, in Timor-Leste or other countries? Uh, well, Bobby, you're absolutely right. We do hope that these lessons help other countries. And we are learning also from other countries which have had similar one. I mean, the lab on wheels, uh, not only for the tuberculosis program, but even otherwise, it's a very important particularly in the uh, arena when we're talking about, you know, high threat pathogens and our ability to detect and diagnose them at an, at the earliest level. At the time when we're talking about climate resilient uh, systems, but the climate sensitive diseases and the related diagnostics that may need to be there, uh, you know, in relation to also uh, the border area, the land border, particularly countries which share the land borders uh, in such places and such a, you know, situations, the lab, the lab on wheels uh, could really play a very, very important role. Uh, the distances, particularly in the geographical terrain that we are talking about between the municipality headquarters, the district headquarters, and a particular site could be quite challenging. Uh, it is still early days for us. We are, uh, you know, like having very seamless operations. We are documenting these lessons that we are coming together both for uh, further scaling up of this experience or variant of these experience. You know, for example, the reason I'm saying uh, it is also to take our learning, early learning from the lab on wheels when we club the, uh, the digital X-ray and the molecular diagnosis to say, can we just take the digital X-ray for a larger number because where is not able to go everywhere. So the variants of this model uh, need to be also adapted and scaled up and replicated. So in Timor-Leste, right now, we are doing a mix of both. But as you rightly said, that the countries with the large geographical area, 
and densely populated one like Bangladesh and Philippines. They are also, you know, like kind of in that mode of having a greater number of uh, labs on wheels and greater number of multifunctional, uh, fun you know, like uh, opportunities or functions that could be available in this kind of vans actually. So I think as we go forward, it should be possible for us to provide more learnings, more lessons uh, on the successes, on the enabling factors, and also not so many uh, you know, challenges that we would be facing. As I said, that currently it is seamless operations, but as we are going forward, we may have lessons that need to be also taken up by other countries, and that's something which we would be sharing. So other than these countries at the moment, I also know that this effort is also being taken up uh, in some countries in Africa and Latin America. So I do hope uh, that such expansion and replication in terms of lessons learned and in terms of taking the, uh, the advantage of the technology forward and closest to the people. Thanks again, Dr. Mathur. <laughs> really, we also hope that this happens um, and really inspires and stimulates more uh, action and more intensified uh, active case finding, truly. This is so important to reach out to, to make sure that we are really able to uh, ensure that diagnosis is accessible. So what, sir, uh, despite so much of efforts, many countries are have missing cases, including India, perhaps there are also missing cases in Timor Leste. So uh, you have already, uh, you know, uh, enlightened us with the what, what uh, you know, how how um, the diagnosis is being done, how intensified case finding is being done. Uh, are there any other things which you would like to add, which needs to happen in terms of uh, reaching out to, uh, you know, more and more people? Yeah, uh, thank you, Bobby. I think very, very important because as I said in the beginning, that there are a number of uh, efforts that one has to make. And um, undoubtedly, this is one disease that we always feel it's been always there. And case detection seems and sounds so very simple. But that's where the whole planning is required. That's where the whole strategy is required. That's the first step. And if the first step is not completed and is not universal, then the next of these steps will be then, you know, proportion of that what we will do. And apart from these approaches that I have already shared with you, I would also like to share that uh, we have also brought in what, as you were saying in your um, uh, intervention with regards to the uh, how much can we reach universally to people, whether it is screening of all, or do we do some differential approach? And I think to that extent, what we brought is a team vulnerability assessment that has been introduced in Timor Leste. Now, this TB vulnerability assessment, it such dwell purpose, of course. One, it is again looking into, uh, you know, like as a as a screening, but importantly, it also looks into what you said about other vulnerabilities as well, but importantly, the risk factors. And I know that we can talk more about it, but in separately, but I just wanted to bring this dimension that while with the screening uh, with the protein x ray and AI that is on one side, the molecular diagnostics that we can bring closest to the people, one of the other approaches that we have been able to also bring in, apart from uh, you know, like the overall universal screening of everyone is this whole concept of the vulnerability assessment survey, which is where we are looking into a better planning and implementation of the case detection initiative. That's something which is where, uh, you know, like we have, we have found that it is important that we identify the high risk people as well, because it serves, as I said, multiple purpose. So uh, I think it is. For, for any country, for any program, uh, to us it is important that it is it has to be context specific. I mean, one size wouldn't fit all, and that's where this why we need these multiple uh, initiatives for active case finding, for intense active case finding. Uh, I think it is it is from place to place that we need to take decisions. Uh, the national TV program managers have to look into. Uh, the epidemiology, they need to look into how, uh, you know, like the scenario is in their particular setting. In one country, we need to adopt different strategies for this particular purpose. Uh, and I think what we are also trying to do, another one, uh, which is like, again, linking to what you said, uh, it's regard to 
I mean, I don't want to call it just as an opportunistic approach, but also a, a strategic one. Uh, we just call it in one means for one or the other reason the bi-directional screening. So how do we go learning from the COVID times and being in the, you know, like in the peak of the COVID-19 when we actually had uh, a third to push for the TV focus so that tomorrow less day doesn't slip back. Uh, we also learned that it is possible for us to have all the SARI, the, the severe acute respiratory illnesses, as well as the uh, influenza-like illnesses patients and the patients who are being detected or being screened for COVID-19, that we could also screen them for tuberculosis. So, you know, like from a general population based screening to a strategic screening that we can look into either through vulnerability assessment on one side, which is at a household level, but on the other side at a facility level, can we do and look into the bidirectional screening? So, my message is that there are multiple approaches, multiple techniques, multiple technologies that are available. And based on our local country context and the situation is what we may need to really uh, adopt or have a mixed approach or a singular approach. But the trust would have to be active case finding and the trust has to be as high as possible the case detection because the next of the steps will then follow uh, with regard to treatment, treatment adherence, concurrently of course with the prevention that we are so focused on because with the preventive therapy that is available now. So that's something which is what I would say. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mathur. Totally agree that local actions are really critical cog in the wheel if we have to translate global goals into reality. So thanks a lot for that. And of course, like, you know, with early and accurate diagnosis, um, the more it becomes a reality, the more we will be likely to break the chain of infection transmission as well. So Dr. Mathur, as you have already, you know, hinted, so can you now move to the next part which is treatment and so how many of these people who are diagnosed from uh you know in the more less day what is the treatment uptake like and which regimens are being used as per the who guidelines uh can you please uh, help us understand that yeah sure uh in fact uh you know like this has been one area because this is where we uh i know that the challenges continue i mean uh, we are very fortunate we have uh, into more or less take a very good partnership between Ministry of Health, the Global Fund, the WHO, and many other partners and players as well. Uh, COECA has been one of the uh, major partner and player. The reason why I'm saying is that because it's important when we talk about treatment, on one side, the WHO uh, recommended regimes need to be made available. And two, they have to be really made available. The drugs, medicines have to be made available in the country. And to that extent, this collaboration and partnerships have really played instrumental role. Uh, the treatment regime that has been developed for four months for the drug sensitive and six months for the drug resistance tuberculosis, and now by all uh, oral shorter treatment regime, which is what is being followed in the country as per the WHO recommendation. And my WHO technical team continues to work with the Ministry of Health as you know, like uh, part of our technical assistance, as part of our agreement uh, with the government and the partners. So these are the regimes that we are, uh, are you know, kind of pursuing and following and are making, uh, you know, like making sure with the ministry and the global fund uh, that these regimes are adhered to so that, uh, you know, like one part is the adherence and on the other side, side we are making sure that these are not stopped out and the supply chain is streamlined and managed and maintained from the center to the municipality to the center level and to the individual level in a way so short, long answer to a short question but very very critical and an important one yeah Yes, absolutely. Totally agree. Very important and critical, sir. Um, also, because these regimens are so are, are the best we have right, right now. Less, way shorter, way less toxic, with uh, way better yes. out treatment outcomes. And uh, let us hope this becomes a reality for all those who need it. Uh, so, uh, um, so Dr. Mathur, what about the risk factors apart from uh, you know TPT, the TV preventive therapy rollout, and the best regimens rollout? Uh, there are other things we can also perhaps mm -hmm. use the risk factors. I was reading the global TB report of WHO 2022, and it states that the all the five top risk factors: malnutrition, tobacco, alcohol, HIV, diabetes, and so these are the things which we which will have. Uh, 
cross sectoral uh, effect if we reduce these risk factors so say for instance tobacco is connected to so many ncds as well as infectious diseases like tb or alcohol so just, just wanted to have your insights on that or uh, what's happening in the world today and uh, uh, yeah in terms of reducing the risk factors very very critical and important dimension and i think as we i mean tuberculosis has been the disease of centuries and we've been learning about tb uh before you know like alongside for uh, hiv and when we said oh these are chronic infections and we forgot the chronic diseases which have been there as well like you said already with regard to the diabetes but timo lester also has a huge challenge and a problem of undernutrition uh we are a country which has a severe challenge with 47% of under 5 children who have been stunted so malnutrition undernutrition for us is a a major risk factor over here if this was not enough because we know malnutrition could be linked with the um, with you know poverty it could also be but to know that they it's not alone the challenge of malnutrition tobacco consumption in the more less they is relatively very high and that put another risk factor you know like for us to be tackling in in fact it is both um, in terms of the uh, the adults tobacco smoking uh is something which uh, i could say is so high uh that we say that in every individual out of 10 may be even exposed to a second and smoking here so given that kind of an exposure you can look at the risk factor that we need to deal and how multi sectorality of the response for tb is important and not only this um because the way that we are a young country uh it's just 20 years old young country there are challenges we do have this factor which is relating to the indoor air pollution as well because still the fossil fuel is burned for cooking in the houses in the particularly in the remote areas and to super adding on to this we do also have uh, the problem of uh, uh, you know like uh, large numbers in terms of the alcohol consumption as well uh, the country which has uh, the you know like alcohol easily available easily initiated and that is where the challenge comes in that when we are talking about uh, prevention when we are talking about actions that need to be taken it's not only for tb and you are right that the, we can bring the tb preventive therapy but these are the factors these are the risk factors which are beyond uh, the health sector and these are some of them that needs to be taken in addition to the actions that need to be taken by the health sector there are other ministries and all and to that extent i would say why i started off earlier with the highest level of commitment be it from the regional level when the regional flagship but also importantly at the country level we have a task force at the prime ministerial level that is multi sectoral and we have now the, the task forces being announced in different municipalities with the intent of addressing the whole issue of undernutrition with the intent of looking into addressing the tobacco control and the effort that who is putting on the tobacco control and the ministry the government has put in we hope that you know like identifying population with these risk factors because as i mentioned in the vulnerability assessment we look into these risk factors along with the elderly population as well but not only found people with the tb and their close contacts whom we could put on the preventive therapy because these risk factors we could bring them to uh, in contact with the health system if there was a diabetic case for example who was detected or if there was a tobacco consumer tobacco smoker uh, they were brought to the in relate in contact with the tobacco cessation centers that who is supporting ministry with so these risk factors compound the whole effect of tb and tb and this is where you know like i always say the, the criticality of uh, multi sectoral response the you know like again health in all policies approach that we have been talking about become so very important because on one side we feel that well fine till we the, the vaccine comes in but these social vaccines can work wonders if we are able to really look into 
So that is control on one side, independent pollution on the other side. Look into the malnutrition issues, the challenges that the, the, that the people have with regard to the nutritional status. And, you know, like plug it, merge it and integrate it uh, with the approach of technology, technological adaptations and innovation that this respectors can actually be then addressed in a more comprehensive manner. Thank you so much, Dr. Mathur. You have put it so powerfully, social vaccine. Absolutely. This is undeniable I, to act upon uh, these risk factors. It will not only have helped the TV program, but also so many more SDGs and so reduce so much unnecessary human suffering and untimely deaths. Uh, we are coming to the end, Dr. Mathur. Is there any other uh, message uh, uh, which you would like to give in context of the upcoming UNHLM on TV? Uh, a couple of points, Bobby, as you said, that we're coming to the close, but I think one point on to which you said about the food, and I think it is very, very important in order to address the malnutrition problem in, in Timor-Leste, we do have um, what is called as the incentive for the TB patient and the worker. I think it is also being done in India uh, and other countries like in Nepal and Bangladesh, and uh, this is very important because that is for the nutritional supplementation and a high nutritious diet and food certainly plays an important role uh, in, in the tuberculosis. So let's again bring in the point of agencies working together, multi-sectoral, multi-ministerial uh, work in action and why highest level of political engagement is so critical at head of state and the head of the government level. Uh, in relation to the point that you were saying in the UN uh, high level meeting, uh, I think it is a great opportunity for member countries uh, because it is not uh, every now that and then that we see that tuberculosis as a uh, uh, you know issue has been taken up at the UN General Assembly. In fact, this year is very uh, very unique because in the UN General Assembly we have uh, three health related high level meetings: one related to pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. Uh, other one is on universal health coverage and third one is on tuberculosis. And to me, it is an opportunity because in one way or the other, they are linked. Like Because in the COVID-19 times, we needed to really, uh, keep the focus on tuberculosis and let the tuberculosis coverages not be slipped. But despite all efforts, it had a very, uh, you know, like huge impact on tuberculosis. Uh, coverages of uh, the detection, treatment and prevention and all the services. In relation to the tuberculosis, I do hope that the political declaration that is being considered by the member countries uh, at the, as an outcome of the UN high level meeting, not only brings together uh, the actions, the science-based practical actionable suggestions to the member countries, the member countries themselves also commit with increased domestic funding. They also should look into embracing the uh, you know, science-based solutions recommended by WHO, be it related to prevention, be it related to detection, be it related to the newer regimes, and invest in human resource development, in the capacity development, and addressing the stigma as well. And this is where I'm looking at that the political declaration would also bring uh, the, the players, the donors, the development partners together for a concerted, cohesive, uh, you know, approaches and funding mechanisms which are not overburdening to member countries. And as we go forward, I do hope that the high-level meeting uh, of, on the TB uh, also provides us opportunity for cross-learning. As you also mentioned in the early time in our discussion, that one country can learn from the other one. So whether it is South-South collaboration and South-South cooperation that we are looking into, or with the situation that the TB is still a problem in the countries of the European region, or the trends are different and they are going differently in other regions as well, probably Southeast Asia region could actually offer a lot of solutions. And such programs actually gives us an opportunity to bring that issue at the level of the head of the state or the head of the government. And some of the governments from the region have really played uh, such wonderful uh, leadership examples uh, in the tuberculosis field. I hope that in the in New York, it would be possible for the member countries to 
we together, the development partner, the civil society, the voices of the community, the voices of the people which have all been heard, all have been taken and they would be there uh, engaged in this particular discussion and dialogue. And, and we look forward to that. Uh, there is a comprehensive multi-sectoral response in action at the uh, country level, at the sub-national level. And in fact, only thing which I would say, at the level of an individual who may have been affected with the tuberculosis, that we have a responsibility to bring the detection, treatment, and all support services to that individual and look into that how soon can we bring him back to the normal health that he or she is entitled to actually. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Arvind Matho, for speaking with us and also for articulating the message so, so, so powerfully. It was a real honor and privilege to speak with you. My uh, sincere thanks and uh, for to Dr. Debasi Skundu, Jyoti Shaila for the support and a special thanks to you too and all your team for spurring innovation and, you know, and change in uh, in context of Timur Leste. Uh, this was really an inspiring moment to see. Usually we hear challenges, but this time we also saw there's so much more could be done with the tools we have, the best of tools we have, and how to deploy them innovatively to reach out to the uh, missing people with TB. Thank you so much, Gabi, and I'm very glad that you acknowledge my team member, Dr. Kundu, who is a firehouse, who's like, uh, like the one who's been at the front end, and uh, Jyoti, who's my communications uh, team lead. Both of them actually have put a lot of best success stories as well. And we would be very happy. We'll keep putting it up on our web and on the social media, but we'll be happy to share uh, our lessons, our learnings, and our successes, and also our challenges together with many other players and partners across the globe. Thank you so very much. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Bye -bye.